Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tech Excellence Podcast. Today, I am joined by two guests, not one, and it's Elina Akerlin from Nordic Node and Chris Radetzky from DAC Digital. Hello. It's great to have you here. Hi, guys. Great to be here. Today, we are going to try to find the answer to the question on how to align the tech vision with the business uh, strategy when you are an early stage startup or even later stage startup. And the reason why I think this topic is relevant is that I've seen, I don't want to exaggerate, but I guess hundreds of startups pitching to the investors and talking about their great ideas, their technology that could change the world. But a lot of them lacked that business aspect, the business vision. And the reason I invited both of you to this conversation is that you have great experience uh, working with tech companies and helping them to align those two elements in order to succeed in the tech space. So maybe let's start with Elena. Could you tell our audience more about how do you work with companies, with tech companies, and what do you do at Nordic Node? Yeah, so we are a capital strategy agency. So we work mainly with capital strategies and funding strategies for startups and scale-ups, which means that we're doing just that, understanding what is the long-term business plan connecting that to the building product, building organization, and then how that will be funded. So we are trying to see, you know, help startups that's kind of, you know, as a founder, you're into the daily, all of the daily stuff. And we're trying to see, okay, but how are you going to do that long term? And what will be the plan? And then ensuring that you have the right investors on board to, uh, to be able to execute on, on that vision. Mm hmm. And Chris, what about you and your superpowers you're using at DAC? Uh, funny question and a good one, actually. Uh, I'm a business major graduate, but I work as CTO at DAC, which means I have uh, those two interesting vantage points on our business. One is to make sure that the tech strategy of DAC is aligned with what the market needs, what our customers require. Uh, but it's also in line with our business uh, perception. How do we make sure that the technology we're using is supplementing our business strategy and our business growth? So it's basically looking from both angles at our future. Okay, and I'm Monica and I like talking about business and technology and everything in between. And this is what we're going to do today about to talk about all those in-betweens and all those areas that are intertwined here. However, before we jump straight into the topic, I would like to ask you about um, some interesting news you've heard from the business space uh, recently, tech slash business space, because I know both of you are, are up to date with uh, the most exciting advancements. So is there anything you would like to share that is worth noticing and maybe you know, our audience uh, should take a closer look at that. Oh, well, if I think about recent uh, days, you can't you can't go unnoticed uh, when thinking about OpenAI and Sora. What mm -hmm. they've done recently with this AI generated 60 minute video uh, is astonishing. And if you look back a year ago, we had this Will Smith eating spaghetti uh, meme uh, created using stable diffusion, how far we've gone from, from that video to those astonishing images showcased uh, this or last week by some, um, that's amazing. And that's a game changer for a number of industries and businesses. That's mm -hmm. my, my take. I, yeah, I can just follow up on that. I really think it's interesting to see the fast development in the AI space and how you're using how we're also progressing from just being a, a new cool technology and seeing how uh, both the advancement of using the technology as a service itself, but also how it can create new business opportunities. And I, I'm, you can really see a plethora of really cool companies coming uh, and developing from the space. So it's something to really look into. Mm -hmm. And anything else that grabbed your attention recently that is worth... I think also, uh, 
Yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of actually coming from a funding perspective. It's been um, an interesting couple of years since the last two years have been, you know, from the pandemic, we had a lot of investments coming into this, into startups and into tech innovations, where the past years has been a bit harder to fundraise. And we're seeing now that a lot of these companies are able to fundraise in both early stage, but also take 11 Labs, for example, that's raising quite a bit of money to expand in this um, in this area. So I really think that we're seeing a more investors are really looking into this space as well to see how and great business opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And speaking of 11 Labs and uh, more on the audio side, I have some uh, interesting um, startup uh, that I would like to to uh, invite you to take a look at. Uh, they um, operate in the space of uh, GSR, which is generative sound restoration. And it's basically using AI uh, engine to clear the audio recordings from the noise, from the different sounds. And for example, today I'm sitting here and it's raining and probably I will have some trouble uh, clearing it from uh, the recording. What they offer is a web app that allows you to upload any audio file and they will clear it from all the noise. However, they will leave their original uh, creator's voice unchanged. Mm -hmm. And the issue that I have faced producing different audio content is that sometimes it changes the voice and it doesn't sound like me or my guests. So yeah. they're called Revoice. It's uh, R-E-V-O-I-Z-E dot, dot com and they're uh, fundraising right now. So something definitely worth uh, watching. Uh, and maybe let's get to uh, the topic of uh, our today's conversation, the original one. So it's aligning the tech vision with uh, the business strategy. So maybe let's start with a very general question. How to even approach it? How do you ensure that the tech vision, the idea, the, the great big idea aligns with overall business strategy? Alina, you want to take it first? Yeah, well, it, um, and one of the most crucial parts here is being coming from the business strategy because technology and tech, I mean, it, we see a lot of technical innovations. You can develop anything, but understanding that how will this solve a customer need and how will the customer be willing to pay for it and hence create uh, a business out of it. I think that is to come from that perspective. I think it's crucial. And having that, um, if you you yourself maybe come from the developing side or from the tech side product, then getting someone on board that has that business vision, mm -hmm. uh, that is going to be crucial to be able to build an actual company from it. I see uh, technology as the great enabler for business. Uh, technologists and tech people like myself often tend to focus on the tech stack. They see it as something attractive, something compelling, something that's an easy sell to the tech audience. But in the long run, you need users and you, you need buy-in from the users. You need to have a product that has active users. And technology should be the, the tool that is enabling that a user to really enjoy the product you're, you're building. So don't think about technology as... Um, as a partner for business, think of it as a service for business. Build something that the users will use and choose the right weapons from your tool stack to do it. And maybe if I can add something from the communication part. Also, um, in most cases, it's worth making sure that you communicate your tech product in a way that the end user understands very well. Because sometimes... It's not the technology that makes the job for them. It's actually the job that is done. Uh, so from communication perspective, I think it's crucial to also like name it in a way that will be understood, even if you have the best technology. In most cases, the end user doesn't really care. They want the job, job done. So this and is what also, I will add from mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Monica. And also adding into that, at 
seeing, I mean, working with startup and innovations for the past 15 years. And what the only thing I can say is that the success, any successful company does not have the product they started with as they're growing because technological shifts and they're developing new things. So just having the customer need in front of you and then develop from that need, because then you could also pick uh, what technology will be best suited for that. Uh, like I remember I had my own startup. We had to put it down after a couple of years because there were this huge technological shift and that we weren't prepared for. Uh, so I've really experienced that firsthand when you have the technology, but you don't have the, that customer need in, in first line of sight. Mm. Yeah, that's actually yeah. an interesting uh, case. And I think a lot of companies actually started with a completely different idea and then turned it into something else based on both the customer's needs and also like, the feedback from the market. Mm, I remember when I've read the story, for example, of Slack, that they actually created the yeah. communicator for some internal project. It was a gaming company and the game was a failure. But mm -hmm. instead of giving up and shutting down, they decided, okay, so let's try to actually make, uh, make it our core product, yeah, the, the communication tool. So sometimes mm -hmm. it's... Uh, I think it's um, in this case, they actually took the technology that they already had, they already developed and decided, okay, let's pivot and use what we have and see if the market actually resonates with that. You need to brace like for those changes because uh, we see that trends and uh, what is attractive today, uh, the, longe longe uh, the longevity of this has decreased uh, uh, immensely over the past years. Uh, so, uh, you don't need to build something that's going to be fashionable today. You need to expect that something might be a trend to the, tomorrow in a few days or in a few weeks and then try and aim for that. Mm -hmm. And I was supposed to ask you about the uh, main challenges. And I think this is one of them, yeah, uh, that the market is changing so rapidly that you need to be agile here and mm -hmm. able to first and foremost predict uh, what's going to be in demand, but also to be able to change the direction if needed, because the, the shifts are so instant that sometimes overnight your solution is no longer relevant. But I think that there is where startups and you know can run so fast. They have an advantage compared to you know these huge tech companies that might have. I mean, they have all the resources but they also is kind of stuck in rigid big organizations where you're supposed to work like that. So for startups and, and for new innovation, it comes organically from the ground and they can run super fast because they don't have that backlog of, of routines and this is how we've done it before. And a lot of companies, I mean, spent millions and trillions of dollars just to come to where they are. And then there's like a, a sunk cost fallacy thing where you don't really want you don't want to scrap that and then you mm -hmm. want, don't want to start over. So also there is a huge opportunity for these early stage companies to, you know, go in and lead the way and, and take that action and see when they see business opportunities, they can just go for it instead of having to deal with an old backlog or something. I completely agree. But there's another aspect of tech challenges that we are facing uh, in our day and age. It's... Uh, the younger generation of developers, they also follow trends. So if you as a business um, focused uh, founder have something to build that you want to build, you also need to convince the, the developers that the tech stack and the tool stack you're going to require while building this is attractive from their perspective. I've, I've heard that number of times in our business that, oh, I don't want to touch it because this tech is old. I don't want to do it because it's a legacy stuff. It's not no longer attractive. I want to, let's say, use Rust instead of uh, building something with C. Uh, mm -hmm. And these are the things we need to also tackle. They do touch the tech uh, aspect of a startup, but they also uh, touch the social aspect of startup. How do you create and foster an environment where people can also, well, embrace the old, which sometimes is required? You know, so I think a business as usual is also important. Yeah. 
Sorry. Yeah, go on, Alina. No, I, I just want to say that business as usual is also, that is where when you find that, that is when you're going to be able to scale because then that you can build from there and build routines and build, you know, and, and that will involve boring tech as well <laughs> that you need to build from. And we're smoothly getting to the topic of scaling and actually, you know, how to prepare your technology and team for scaling, especially when you're in the early stage. Probably, I, I think it's a um, it's quite a common thing that companies, although usually the founders, they have big dreams, they still don't expect that uh, the solution will be, let's say, a global success. And I think we've met such situations uh, with our clients at, at DAC that they came to us because they underestimated uh, the scaling. They never knew that uh, they would want to develop their app further or their solution, then, then expand their solution. And now they're stuck because they have, like, let's say, too many users, too many functions, but uh, you know, uh, not sufficient infrastructure. So how to make sure that you're prepared for scaling? Well, a good, good point is always to start with the mature and the right architecture, something that will uh, be built with the mindset of scaling that to a greater number of users. Uh, design something that is going to work and be cost effective for 10 users and equally effective uh, for 10 million users, something that will auto scale and auto downscale in the backend. And also do not underestimate things like, well, it's just a small radio button I need to add here, probably doesn't cost much. Things like that typically have some consequences in the entire stack from the front end or mobile application through the backend and anything that has to do with persistence of data. So uh, build architecture, have the right CTO, have the right solution architect that has that mindset of not building to tear down and rebuild again, but to uh, build on top of something that is robust from day one. Mm -hmm. And Alina, how about yeah. the perspective of uh, mm -hmm. funding and capital? How to prepare for scaling in this area? I would say that, I mean, that, that applies not only for tech, but for the whole company, that scaling and, and be able to scale is where you go from this generalist idea where, you know, everyone needs to get their hands dirty and everyone is sort of everywhere in the company because you're a small team and, you know, sit together and you do all of these things together to with like tape and glue and, you know, trying to fix stuff that, that arise in order and then you when you scale you need to build specialist structures and you need to spend money on, on understanding how you really can you know you start to to find these specialists and you need to find managers that understand that um and that is what you're going to need your investment for and that just for that and not just trying to be like super frugal and really getting the numbers down and try to not spend money on that because that is what's going to be important moving on and then from you know pure funding perspective, one of the things that I see a lot of companies struggling with in scaling is that scale and growth is kind of defined by how many mid-level managers you're going to be able to have. Like, Because you're going to need to build teams and you're going to need to build, and that applies for, that applies for sales, that applies for tech. Uh, it applies for in, in every part of the company that you need to start building like management levels and talking about tech trends in general and startups, there's been a lot of trends to have these like really flat organizations, but that makes it kind of hard to scale if you don't have a uh, decision path moving in, in within the different sectors of the company. And you need to start building different departments in or, order to build the ability to scale and grow and become, you know, go from a startup to a real company. <laughs> it's like, th that is the transition that you need to make. And like, yeah, it's boring, but mid-level managers, it's a, it's a thing. <laughs> uh, but still when, you know, the, the structure slowly comes to fruition and it actually starts resembling, the, let's say, the real company. <laughs> Um, or like a traditional company is a traditional one. company, yeah, company. Yeah, yeah. I just want to make sure conventional that company yeah. how to still foster that culture of innovation and continuous learning within the teams because you know we're in the startup environments let's say it's it's natural 
everyone is trying to innovate, collaborate, learn new things, and even use the tape and glue. And how to keep that spirit uh, once the company is scaling? Because, you know, there's still the vision yet to change the world uh, with your technology. So can you maybe both share some uh, thoughts and observations on how to keep that um, kind of yeah. spirit within the company, even if yeah. it grows and scales? Um, I like to think that true leadership comes from empowering people to fail and fail again, because uh, you learn the most from your failures uh, in the tech stack, in the direction you've chosen. If anything that you have done so far was just a pure success, you don't have this uh, vantage point of where, what if something goes wrong. And in our teams, we like to empower people to say deploy coach production in the first week of their presence within our team because this will teach them the entire process they will see that they are not just a small cog in a machine but they are part of an organism that relies on them heavily netflix has this interesting philosophy of making sure that any person within the team can be uh, exchanged by another member if they have to go on vacation or are on sick leave, uh, we like to do the same with our teams. People within our organization um, are empowered to fail, are empowered to make mistakes. And then seniors and architects and tech leads are there to pick them up and help them, not by dissing and saying, well, you've done this wrong, but by explaining what's the right way to do it. And this learning experience stays with them forever. And we see how they really mature within a few weeks time, few months time to a person in the next seniority level in their, um, in their technology uh, stack. Um, and it's actually rewarding for, for a manager to see that this path uh, of, of growth, of, of nurturing innovation by empowerment to uh, make mistakes is really the right way to go. Yeah, but I... I think that, I mean, you're going to general, we work like that. We're going to do things that we get measured on or that we get recognition for. So it could be a lot of, especially in, in scale, when you scale, you need to find like your KPIs and you need to understand, okay, what is important in this company? Uh, so that is one way of like steering the organization is like we measure development or not results or like, or and also results because you still get to need that. But I, I, I truly, it's a balance between the two, because if you're always going to be, you know, failing or <laughs> try to develop new things, then you're still going to need to clear, like a clear path to those milestones that you're going to be setting up. So I usually say um, with a lot of our clients that we're working with, we kind of scope, um, especially when, when you're going to take in an investor is going to invest money and they want to see, you know, they want to see exponential returns. They're not going to say, hey, try it out uh but we've been doing that like we're scoping things so this is our trial and error budget and this is our like operation budget um take marketing for an example that's a great example of okay we can we have uh consumers as our target group are we going to go for instagram linkedin or facebook or uh, google ads and then you set aside we don't really know but we know we need to get this money um users or viewers or, or like interactions. So then we set aside, okay, we have 10,000 euros here. We have 10,000 euros here. We have five here and 10 here. And then after a month or after, you know, you can do it sequentially or you can do it parallel, but to you not know, scope it so that you don't keep on just, you know, pouring money down in something that obviously didn't work because you're deciding that you're over oh, nearly there. So that is one of the main issues. I think like when you're, going to be working with development or, or trying this like trial that you're going to try new things is that you don't scope it enough so you keep on <laughs> kind of steering away from that it, it, because it's a new thing and you know it's always going to come we're as we started with it's always going to come the flavor of the month in new technologies or uh, how the market is moving so kind of you know find a scope where you have these wiggle room but still sort of a path forward Investors tend to like that as well when you kind of, you know, have a budget <laughs> so they can calculate stuff. And I think we're pretty much aligned in our uh, perception here. The, the, my vantage point is the one of a tech leader who needs to have people who are maturing within the, the team. 
um, yeah. if you have the sense as an employee or as a developer that you're no longer increasing your capacity, your your technology stack, your knowledge, then you might get fed up with that organization. And we see that younger people tend to jump between teams or uh, companies quite frequently recently. We want to have this attachment and the attachment comes from um, helping them to become better. Obviously, there's always an architect or tech lead who makes sure that we are within the budget, we are within the lines that you have defined from, from investor's perspective. And uh, yeah. we've been doing successfully, but um, no, not anything ends up in a happy path. Uh, and we know that but, in this development. But I, I think it's a lot about understanding how, how we're going to build a learning organization so that we, we're not invent, trying to invent the wheel every time. So that every learning gets, you know, trickled down in the organization. Uh, and then if you want to try the same thing again that didn't work then you have to understand okay this is the new addition to it and that's how we're going to foster innovation continuous innovation in organization correct okay so um since we've tapped uh, on the investors i would like to ask you like from both technical standpoint and let's say business strategy standpoint what do investors look for in startups during the fundraising process and let's focus on the earlier stage uh, it's it depends a bit on how early are you do you have like do you have a working product or not if it that you only have an idea of a product then that's going to be, okay, how can you execute on that? How can you build that? And then if you have an early product, it's going to be more about how do you find the customers? Um, we have like a 17-step ladder <laughs> of exactly how you're going to be measuring uh, like a tech development and also what in investors are. They are kind of narrow usually in their investment um, mandates. So it's also about finding investors that are in your mandate and, and within those brackets where you're looking for. And mm -hmm. it's also part of fin funding, like how much money do you think you're going to need? Because that would also apply into like, what can we do with those money and, and valuation wise? Three years ago, no one really cared about valuation. Uh, right now, people really care about valuation. So that is an important thing to be, okay, if we're going to need a lot of money, because I mean, we do have big tech stack moving it is usually that is what's going to be cost a lot of money then how do we scope it or scale it down like how do we build milestones from there where we can get investors to tag along and also to ensure that how if i get a, a venture capital on board in my company they want to get like a 10x return or something in the, in a short period of time so it's also part of explaining or storytelling and saying that this is how our company going to go from here to here <laughs> in a short period of time. Um, so it's a lot about communication and communicating your vision, but also understand like, where are we right now? Uh, customer wise, product wise, organization wise and money wise. So these are the four and, and you can't only have product and you can only have business so you have to like balance, it's a balance between all of these different areas that you have to consider. From my perspective, it, it feels like um, one crucial component is the team. Uh, the team that is yeah. able to communicate what they want to achieve. If you have the greatest ideas, but you cannot sell them to an investor, you will have tough time to sell them to the users as well. Um, so the team needs to be able to execute. They have to work with, together with each other um, smoothly. It has to be the right dynamics uh, within the small organization. Um, obviously, it has to be an idea or a product that's very difficult to replicate, even if you throw a lot of money at, uh, at, a, at a company. So imagine you build something that state-of-the-art uses AI or new AI trends. Um, the first question that I would ask probably from investor standpoint is, what if Google throws in $100 million at a team and says, do the same, will they achieve it? And if the answer is yes, then it's a risky investment because those trends tend to be picked up by bigger players very early on, replicated, 
and then a sold to the existing user base and your startup and in uh, in a very dark place. So um, brilliant minds combined together with a tech that's difficult to replicate without those minds is something that seems to be one uh, aspect. Uh, obviously, further down the road, user base. If you are in a pre-seed stage, you have an idea, you want to build it, it's fine not to have users. But if you're raising, uh, let's say, a seed or a Series A, it, there, there should have be there should uh, be some traction there on the market, right? You're not building for yourself; you're building for others. And if there's no user base, maybe there's no product. And and especially, uh, I I try to refrain from calling it users because I think the users are kind of useless <laughs> if <laughs> if there's not a business model attached to it. So especially from an investor point of view, it's like how do you get revenue from it so can how how early can you try it out so if everyone really likes the product and uses it but no one wants to pay for it then it's still not going to be a viable business uh so it's also understanding like okay maybe right now we can we have to do like a trial period to get recognition for the product still have that revenue or business model in mind i think it's going to be crucial in order to be able to build from there uh, mm -hmm. But just to tie in Christoph's like the the team, it's understanding that you will need a variety of competencies. If you're three developers, you need to have someone that understands uh, how to build an organization, how to find customers and develop that. So you're gonna need that is why investors all early stage investors are always like, oh, team is the most important part. But it is the ability to build a business or a company that is what they're looking for. And again, you're going to need a variety of competences in order to be able to build that. Yes. Yep, you're nodding your you're nodding your head. So like, yeah. I believe we can get to the uh, we can get further. Mm, and the interesting thing that you've mentioned about those uh, useless users uh, actually, uh, the previous episode of the podcast, uh, my guest uh, Maya Voye shared some uh, insights on pricing. And she also pointed out that sometimes the users say, yeah, it's a great product. We would love to use it. But then when you ask them, okay, but how much are you going to pay for it? Are you willing to pay? And they're like, oh, no, actually... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so I think also like having that pricing in mind uh, from the very early uh, stage and getting back to the pricing strategy <laughs> makes sense because probably at the beginning, maybe you would like to have a slightly lower price uh, to attract uh, the early users, but then you also need to be profitable. And mm -hmm. um, so, so definitely, it, if anybody is interested in uh, in the topic of uh, pricing and uh, methods for checking uh, the um, willingness to pay, uh, you can watch the previous episode with Maya. I'm going to do that. <laughs> but it's also understanding a part of that pricing model and pricing strategy. It's also understanding who who is the customer. And then there could be a user attached to that. Like it may be if you want to target like, developers, the user going to be employed at a company, maybe it's going to be a business to business revenue model um, that can be based on having users in, in the system or where you can find a fee somehow, or uh, it could also vary over time. Maybe it's like, we need to prove our product. So we're starting with targeting uh, private like consumers at the beginning or you, private users that, that can work it. And then we can build on to finding partnerships with larger corporations or with other companies and sell to companies instead. So I, I've been work, I work mainly with uh, deep tech and, and hardware companies and so like research-based innovations, which is uh, their tech stack is a whole other thing. But it's uh, most of them have companies as their customers and that requires a completely different pricing strategy and also how you're going to be validating with beta customers and beta tests and so on because a large corporation won't just build try out your product because they have a whole they have a, a huge department just working with purchasing so 
you're not just going to get in there. You have to find collaborations and partnerships in another way. So a pricing, could, it will vary over time. And they also understand like where are, where, what can we charge now? And what can we charge in the future? It's very different. And for a consumer product, it's, or a user product, it's even more understanding how, how sticky can we get the product so that they will continue to pay. And when we add more features, then we will be able to charge more. But they, again, must be balanced or aligned. If, from my perspective, it feels like this first step is always the most difficult one. How to convert a non-paying user or, or, of the freemium plan to a paid plan user. And once you do that, uh, uh, the upselling of new features seems to be an easy part. The card is already attached to your profile. You just check new boxes and agree to a new subscription price paid towards the end of the month. But this this free paid this first pay, uh, free user who has to pay initial fee do this magic move of connecting your card or attaching your PayPal account to this uh, product. That's a challenge. And I say this as a user myself when I. So I need to edit a PDF document. I typically write a free PDF online editor. And the one that charges me, I did basically skip first, right? Uh, yeah. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. But I would say if you're looking to uh, a timeline over the past, I don't know, 10 years, we really see a big change in this, like a, a user or behavior, um, how they... We went from everything we're supposed to be free and open source and share and, and no one really like um, until most people understand that we're willing to pay. Subscription economy is a thing <laughs> like it's a baseline for how we get charged and, and pay for stuff. So we don't there's a ton of these examples. Uh, and there's also a. Uh, like an understand, we understand we've been maturing as a, a customers that we understand we need to pay for um, quality. So the, the when you have found the stickiness or or the user needs and really like getting a match for the user need, then it's easier to get paid for it. But you have to get over that hurdle because we all know that there's a lot of really. Uh, crappy or shady free solutions out there as well. So you, re but when you find the the programs that you like, you kind of tend to stick with them. I think yeah. it also comes down to uh, companies communicating the value that you get uh, for yeah. the price. If I understand clearly, why is it better to use the uh, paid PDF converter? Uh, than the free one, for example, because uh, there's um, some data security, et cetera. I don't know any other things that might be relevant, then I'm willing to pay. Uh, and also with other products, for ex uh, I can um, actually give a real life example of Calendly versus a paid system. And Calendly is great, but it's lacking some functions. And also everyone knows it's free, at least to some degree, because obviously they also have the enterprise plan. Uh, but um, at some point it shows some limitations and also um, it might be deemed as less professional um, compared to, let's say, some customized system uh, that gives you more features. And uh, as a person who has a lot of meetings, a lot of bookings, etc., cetera, um, I understand the value in having the better paid option here. So it's also when the users mature enough, they used enough uh, free tools and they see uh, what was wrong with them, they understand the value of the paid ones. I think that's um, the, the, the value. Yeah, it's a part of the customer paid. journey maturity. Like they mature more. Uh, I, I do pay for my PDF converter <laughs> services. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in order that I see I need it because I need to have that full operation of freedom and I, I want to know where my data gets stored because it's like if it's agreements that's kind of sensitive and then I also want to have them in the same place and no I don't want to no I want to know I want to have a relation uh, with my provider to have that feel that if sense of you know safety it's a safe place where I can share uh, like private private document or sensitive data that I know. So I, I do feel a 
relationship with Adobe is a bit like over. It's a bit uh, too much to ask but I feel that that I I will have a big problem with changing that because now everything is stored there. I have all my presets done. I can get in and ha work with exactly what I want, and, and that's fine. But I think we are in a minority, you and me. Uh, we, <laughs> yeah, understand we are. Privacy, but look, look at my kids, look at uh, current teenagers. They share private, uh, private data online all the time, and I don't think they yeah. really embrace the, the online privacy and understand the consequences of losing it. So there's a... The, the right product fit here is how do you convince people to really pay for something um, and do this on a broader audience? Um, Monica has used Calendly as, a, uh, as an example. I think that that's a great company with some really cool features attached to the um, planning feature, like payment for, uh, for a meeting, for example. You can attach um, um, connected to Stripe and uh, require your um, uh, participant to pay for the services. But recently, Google, for those who are using uh, Google Workspace, has released a similar feature for planning. It's called, I think, Google Scheduler. And uh, I see a great risk for Calendly's model if most of the startups, most of the people utilizing those services will switch to a uh, built-in solution, their model is going to lose some traction, probably. I just did that. I switched from Calendly to Google, actually. And yeah. that was, I think, and that's another trend in the market that from, you know, having all of a thousand different subscriptions and everyone was at different places to get that. I just want one point of entry. So I use my Google Calendar and I have a lot of different emails because I, I do some like interim, I have an interim assignment, I have Nordic Know My Company, and I also have a private calendar. I just want to collect like it at one place. And then I want to be able to invite that takes all of that into account. So yes. it, we're seeing when we're seeing that, so it, it's usually like that with technological shifts uh, coming back to the AI that we started talking about. And right now we're in this explosion of different AI. <laughs> IDs that you can utilize and then I really think we're going to see a merge again coming in because that's usually how technology how technology go development is going uh, from a business perspective how we're seeing that companies get acquired by larger corporations or that smaller companies merge because you want from the customer perspective what is, what are you willing to pay for I want more features and maybe then you, instead of having like all of these different uh, apps and stuff, I just want one because there's a kind of app fatigue in that one. I don't want to download another app. Like take parking. I I live in Sweden. I have, I don't know, I have seven different parking apps. So depending on which city I am, I am in, I'm going to need to, you know, download some new things and understand where how it's going to work and, you know, get my card in there. So it takes me like 10 minutes to park anywhere. Uh, so that is one example of like, this would be really nice to, to, to put in one under one umbrella. And there's a lot of these, yeah. That's just one example, and I think we're seeing that a lot, especially in the business workspace, where we have all of these different subscriptions, um, and then you know how we, we just want one point of entry to become more efficient, and in order to be actually utilizing all of these amazing features that have been developed that can really help us moving forward, but we just need to you know have the energy to understand okay where I'm supposed to log in now. I just want one. Um, but APIs are doing a great job with that as well. Like you can have Slack integrated with your Google workspace and things you can be smooth. So APIs solve a lot of that as well. And actually as a user, I'm willing sometimes to pay slightly more just to have this one convenient point of entry, like uh, yeah. different train providers and local uh, carriers here in Poland. I will choose one application that allows me to book uh, travel with all of them from a single point rather than having five or six different apps for each provider and then go through them. So this one a euro more paid for the service seems like a, a well, convenience um, that was worth the money. Uh, that's my and that's also an innovation. It is. And also I see that some of the startups even to, to move uh, from this, this API discussion to a business case, 
some startups actually expect to be bought probably further down the road because it's very difficult to find uh, the user base that will keep you fed if you grow and uh, you want to scale your business. So it seems like a model I, I can uh, recognize globally to be, build a startup designed to be hired. There is a grand plan, obviously, to go to a billion users five years from now that you sell in the pitch deck. But uh, deep inside, you expect to be bought. Babel Apps was oh, bought yeah. as, an, as an example. And uh, interesting, right? How do you say Yeah, even the I... range of uh, corporate uh, venture capital, a lot of big corporations, they have their funds with the intention to actually, you know, later on acquire the company. So it's, uh, I think it's the, like the, another route for the founders to capitalize on their idea. Not necessarily yeah. running the business forever, but exiting um, via just selling the solution to to a bigger player and making sure even more um, people take advantage of the the great technology that they design. Yeah. But I, I think they don't like it. Is it the case? I mean, if you tell the the truth, hey, I I'm building something because I expect to be bought. It doesn't seem to be something that VCs really appreciate. They want to have the big vision, right, Elena? Um, yes and no. <laughs> I mean, uh, venture capital is VC funds. They have, you know, their idea of how it's supposed to look. Uh, if you're seeing a CVC, like a corporate venture capital, they have a completely different route. So it's kind. Of, it's usually kind of hard to get them in the same, investing in the same sort of companies. Uh, and then you need to tell slightly different stories. But I mean, again, coming from, you know, this, like a lot of different paths going into the merger ID. I also see a lot of, especially really tech heavy, super tech heavy startups. They also need, otherwise they're going to need to raise all, so much money. It's hard to find that base. But within a big corporation, you could both elevate the internal R&D and, and, you know, buy things. And, and then merge in order to get that technology out there. But I, I'm not going to say that. I mean, VC, as per se, their business model is to make exponential revenue or, or exponential returns from their investments. That is their whole case. So if they see that, okay, if we get on now and then we see a clear path to exit, then that necessarily is not a, a wrong thing to do. And I mean, the whole idea is like when you get an investor on board, you need to have an exit plan for them and might most likely also for you. Uh, but on the contrary, we're also seeing that historically, the idea of an exit for a company has been a full acquisition that someone else will be buying the whole company and everyone will exit at the same time. And especially in these companies we're seeing coming now, more and more advanced technologies that's going to take a longer time to develop. We also, that is something that we work a lot with right now at Nordic Note to see how can you create exit like bus stops? How can you create partial exits where early stage investors can get off and then uh, VCs can get in and out and, and to, to get that, ensuring that you have a cap table that like owners in the company that are aligned with the business vision of the company, you know, these different levels. So that you don't have a, a dissonance between these um, intentions with different stakeholders. So I, I think that it's not a bad idea to start it. If you see that, okay, in three years, we can actually get acquired and make a lot of money. It's a nice thing because that's why investors invest. <laughs> Uh, but it needs to be framed in the way that if this doesn't happen, because that's a big, huge risk just to develop technology yeah. uh, and hope that it will be acquired, that is poses a risk. So you're still going to need to have the the plan of we can stand on our own business. We, we can stand on our own feet. We do have a solid revenue model. We can survive and thrive, not only surviving, but thriving this company on ourselves but there is a, an evident possibility that we can get acquired. So you can't just, if you're only saying that we're going to develop huge technology and then we're going to get acquired, then you're not going to be investable. 
But if you say we have a build, we're building a great product, we're going to be able to make a lot of money on that and grow exponentially. And but we could also be acquired in a couple of years. So it can be one part of the plan, but it can't be the plan because that we, then you will fail. Mm. Okay, we're slowly uh, running out of time and the discussion is so vivid. So it's a shame we don't have more. I would like to um, get to the last uh, point today. And uh, it sort of resonated throughout the conversation and especially at the point of uh, talking about investors. But um, I would like to talk about the importance of partnerships uh, when you're running um, a startup and being a part of an ecosystem. Could you share some thoughts on that? Who? Mm, yeah. You want to take a step first? Yeah, you, you go first. <laughs> um, well, with ecosystems and uh, networks uh, comes well, networking part, that's the most important thing for me. You are embedded uh, in a uh, uh, ecosystem where people share your vision, share your uh, passions, can support you. You can ping uh, your ideas off of them. You can ask them for introductions to potential investors. Uh, you're not left alone and swimming in this entire sea of money not not knowing where to tap where to uh where to uh who to talk to uh so people who uh have struggled with the same issues you're struggling they can empower you to stay on course they can help you uh, stay focused uh they can share their uh failure stories and showcase that through passing through those failures they have achieved success and they are where they are today it's motivating if if you are really low as a, as a as a founder and that happens a lot more often than not um you need someone who will tell you hey it's okay to be here i've been there but if you persist in your uh in your vision if you persist with your ambitions uh, you will eventually find someone who also shares your vision finding one, two, three investors who do not follow what you want to build and what you want to set up and they decline you is not the end of the world. Uh, finding the one who really shares your passion is the key to success and being embedded in a partnership or ecosystem of people who uh, do the same will help you with that. Definitely. I think that one of the big successes that you have with the past years that we've been able to go a lot more digital is that you can think much more global from the beginning with your network as well. So I would say, I mean, finding expert clusters or like clusters, finding your um, cluster is a great thing. Take, for example, I'm, I'm based in, in West of Sweden in Gothenburg. We are really good at climate tech and, and hard or R&D for like hardware and stuff like that. But if you're going to be building a consumer like B2C uh, sales company, it, this won't be the right arena for you. Uh, it, it can be, but it's going to be harder because we don't have that, you know, infrastructure for that sort of company. So maybe you should find a cluster somewhere else, like go to Stockholm or go uh, to Berlin or whatever, like find your cluster and, and um, take... The Baltics, for example, has been great in working with Web3 and crypto and stuff like that. Go there, find people there that can share your vision. And I would say that go earlier than you thought you would, because if you're going to have a global plan, you need to think that in much earlier stages, like your customers will be over the world. Okay, your investors should be over the world or like finding where are the the networks where are the ecosystems that are best fitted for us you might not need to move there but you can you know find experts in that realm maybe go to events or listen into digital seminars uh search for linkedin you know just do outreaches because that is really valuable and it, as crystal was saying like you so if that one is not right for people like to help they will forward you to someone that will. 
And um, so really do that sort of like due diligence on the different ecosystems because they will look different in different countries in different parts of Europe and in the U.S. That's a whole uh, another story that we can continue talking about. But, and even in different cities will have their different expertise. Uh, if you're a life science company, you should have some sort of presence in Denmark because they are really good at it, for example. Now I'm doing a lot of Northern European examples because where I'm, I'm based here, but it's you find your cluster will help you to find an ecosystem that can support you and elevate you. And you're going to be able to find those experts. You're going to be able to find investors that understand your vision of what you're doing. And then for partnerships, I would also really, really want to recommend that as an early stage startup, you can't, you're a generalist company at that stage. You can't be specialized in a lot of things. So maybe take help from a, I mean, from a tech architect to, to help you really understand the basis, do that earlier on. So you don't need to rebuild stiff stuff later on, uh, get, get a couple of hours from a lawyer to get everything, you know, set. don't use, well, you can use start with ChatGPT, but you're going to need someone with real competence to, to expert ex- expertise to, to um, l- elevate on that. Because that, you know, just think ahead slightly in the beginning will ensure that you're going to be able to run much faster. And then finding those partnerships with different sort of expert organizations, then you can get the help that you need in order to, you know, run faster in the end. Yeah, that sounds like a perfect closing thought. <laughs> yeah. However, if there uh, are any closing thoughts that you would like to share or some message to our listeners, now is the right time uh, to put uh, put that message through. I what would did. you like <laughs> one one sentence uh, that you would say to an early stage deep tech founder, let's say. One piece of uh, advice. Stay hungry and stay on course. Uh, If you have found something that is really uh, game changing, uh, that's really has, that can have impact on uh, our lives and society, uh, modern civilization, um, be persistent and uh, build it and show it to the world. And then let's see how we can really use it to a greater good. Uh, be that for agriculture, be that for speech enhancement, be that for audio enhancement, but uh, just do it. Yeah, I can really add on to that. And also I would say, I say that to every early stage founder and it's like, you're the expert of your company. So, I mean, people love giving advice. We're just talking about like partnerships and, and finding that that input, but you are the expert of your company. And especially when you're, I mean, as, as you grow and take on more stakeholders, uh, you will have employees, you will have investors that will all give you advice. But just, you know, as Chris was saying, like find your path and then you could take in a lot of input, but still you're always going to be the expert of your company and have ensure that you have the final say. So really think about how all of this input will align with your long-term vision. I think that's going to help you to make hard decisions. uh, And it's also going to help you to stay on course and build a company that you want to build. Okay, that's uh, like a powerful closing. Thank you very much for joining me today. It was great having you. And uh, I um, invite everyone uh, to subscribe to the podcast because every week we're interviewing experts about topics in between business and technology.